Good morning. Nelson Mandela said that no one truly knows a nation until they've spent time in its jails. A nation shouldn't be judged by how it treats its highest members, but its lowest ones. I'm here to tell you why I believe that what happens in prisons affects all of us, and why I'm proud to be, to be known as a prisoner by choice. At the age of 18, I went from the UK to volunteer to hospice in Uganda. One day, I went with the hospice's doctors and nurses to Malago, Uganda's national referral hospital, where they were taking morphine to a dying patient. As the team went to see their patient, I noticed a man lying on the floor by the toilets. He was naked. As I approached, I saw that he was lying on a plastic sheet in a pool of urine. I asked the nurse, what's happening to this man? She said, he was found collapsed by the police in a market. We don't know his name. We don't know how to trace his family. We think he's got diabetes and we're waiting for him to die. I saw that he was as thin as a skeleton. The flesh on his bottom and his back was rotten down to the bone because he was lying un unconscious in his own waist. I understood that for patients in that hospital, if they didn't have family or friends to bathe and feed and pay for their treatment, they would go without. It challenged me. I returned to the hospital the next day and bought a basin and some soap and a towel. I found a nurse who'd been trained in palliative care by the hospice, and together we bathed him. I went to the laundry and got him a sheet and an overall to cover him. And I tried to advocate for him with the doctors and nurses that they could treat him, although he had no relatives and no money. I did that for five days. I came on the sixth day and found that he had died the night before. He was lying on the floor, naked. After a little while, a porter came with a trolley with a dead woman on it. They put his body on top of hers and said that together they'd go to a mass grave with others who had no families. That was a turning point in my life. I realized that there was a group of people in this world who for whatever reason had been judged by their community to have no value. The period that I spent in that hospital was a time of formation for me when I realized that it was a great privilege to care for those living on the edge of society. I spent three months in that hospital bathing and feeding patients dying of AIDS with tuberculosis who'd been abandoned by their families. I met prisoners there. They were brought to the hospital from prison when they were close to death. Usually they were teenage boys who were in prison for having underage sex, which in Uganda has a maximum penalty of death. Although at that time, two thirds of prisoners in Uganda had had no trial, so they hadn't been convicted of anything. I saw that in hospital, those prisoners were often rejected by the doctors and nurses, that they could die from starvation or dehydration. I decided to get permission to go to the prison that they came from, Lazira Maximum Prison. Built in 1927 by the British for 600 inmates, it now has around three and a half thousand. I started by going to death row, holding 500 inmates. I was told of a man called Edward Mpaji. He'd been on death row for 12 years, having received the death penalty for murder. At that 12 year mark, it turned out that the person he had killed was in fact still alive. It took another six years after that revelation for him to be released. I was told of another man who had stolen a mango. He used a penknife to cut it from a neighbor's tree and therefore had con committed armed robbery, for which there was no other penalty in Uganda but death. I was told that these weren't one-off cases, that there were hundreds of prisoners who were in a similar situation one official estimated that 50% of those who'd received the death penalty in Uganda were innocent of uh, the crime they'd been charged with. After going to death row, I went to the prison hospital, and as I entered, a teenage boy died. I saw that the place stank. 
the windows were smashed. There wasn't furniture. I don't know what he'd done, why he was in prison, but I thought no one deserves to die in such an environment. Having spent time in hospice, I realized that we all want to have dignity, that the environment that we find ourselves in affects the way that we feel about ourselves, even in the last days and hours and minutes of our life. I hadn't seen what difference I could make in the government hospital where the needs, needs seemed overwhelming. But in this prison hospital, I felt maybe I could make a difference here. So I returned to the UK to raise money to refurbish it. I decided I would approach my friends and family, my old school and church. But I saw that prisons weren't necessarily an easy sell. People wondered why should we invest money in serving prisoners? It's a conversation that I've had thousands of times over the last 10 years. I spent time in prisons all over Africa and I've seen so much injustice, so many people in prison who don't deserve to be there, so many poor and vulnerable people who've come into conflict with the law and are suffering massively. I don't have time now to paint a full picture, but I want to tell you about a few of the people I've met who helped to shape me and motivate me to serve prisoners. One was a man called Charles. He'd been accused of theft and beaten by the police until he had three fractures in his skull. Many of his ribs were broken and his fingers. I found him in a hospital ward in a corner. He'd been there for four days and he was bleeding out of his eyes and his ears and his mouth. No doctor or nurse had attended him because he was a suspect. With my colleagues, we cared for him for many weeks, and he recovered. Another of those that uh, challenged me was Susan. She received the death penalty in Uganda at the age of 21 for killing her husband, who had beaten her for a number of years. She shared a small death row cell with four other women. There was no bed, no mattress, no toilet. I realized that women were very vulnerable in the hands of the law. Once I went to the women's maximum security prison in Juba in South Sudan. As the door was opened, I saw a woman with heavy chains around her arms and her legs. I said to the warder accompanying me, why is she chained up? He said, we chain our lunatics and those who got the death penalty. I said, what happened to this woman? He said, she was sentenced to death. I asked why. He said, well, like a number of the other women here, she's not done anything wrong. It was her husband who was accused of a serious offense, but because the police couldn't catch him, they caught her and she was tried and waits to be executed on his behalf. Another prison officer in South Sudan told me of a five-year-old child swimming in a river with a three-year-old friend. The three-year-old had drowned and the five-year-old was arrested and sentenced to death for murder. With the funds I raised, I went back to the maximum security prison in Kampala and worked with prisoners and prison staff to refurbish the prison hospital to create a clean, well-equipped, dignified environment. I saw that this motivated the doctors and nurses who had been meant to work there, but when the environment was miserable before the refurbishment, often failed to come to work. The death rate at that prison, I was told, dropped from 144 in the year before the refurbishment to 12 in the year after. I saw that when you invest in prison's infrastructure, it changes the way that prison staff feel about their work and that prisoners feel about themselves. I returned to the UK to begin studying law. I spent my university holidays in prisons in Uganda and Kenya and Sierra Leone, establishing the first prison libraries in Uganda and doing work on prison clinics. I saw that all over Africa there were similar challenges in terms of massive overcrowding, people who'd been tortured by the police, those who'd been in prison for five or 10 or 20 years without trial, and that 80 or 90% of prisoners would never meet a lawyer. In 2007, I established the African Prisons Project to bring dignity and hope to men, women, and children in prisons in Africa through healthcare, education, and access to justice. For us, dignity is about how one lives whilst they're in prison. 
It's about not having one's humanity stripped away from them. It's about not dying of unnecessary disease whilst in prison. Hope is about equipping oneself with the skills and attitude needed to support one's family and to contribute to one's community upon release from prison. I realize that around the world, almost everyone who's in prison today is one day going to go back to their community. No one leaves prison unchanged by it. I saw that either prisons could be places where inmates are changed, they're invested in, they gain skills, they realize that they have an alternative to crime, or they can be houses of deprivation where inmates are broken down, they're brutalized, they lose their self-esteem or their sense of self-worth. The approach of the African Prisons Project has evolved over the years. We saw that it's right to have decent uh, clinics and education facilities in prison, but by themselves, infrastructure isn't enough. We then started providing basic health and education and legal services, running mother and baby reading groups so women in prison with their children could teach them how to read and write. We were invited to expand all over Uganda and all around Africa. But we saw it was impossible to do it by ourselves. We couldn't raise the resources to, to take up the invitations that we'd received. We realized that we didn't have to do it by ourselves, though that in prisons around Africa and around the world, there were gifted, bright, talented people who were already using their time and resources to make a difference in the lives of others. I saw it when I went to death row in Uganda and on the stairs going up to the gallows with a door at the top that says danger zone, heaven road, there was a class taking place where a prisoner was teaching his um, fellow inmates for O-levels, exams which are taken in parts of the Commonwealth at the age of 16. I saw that in prison hospitals, inmates would care for their sick peers. I felt that if we could identify these change makers amongst prisoners and prison staff and connect them and give them more training and more resources, they could bring transformation in their prisons and in their nations. We've seen that change is possible even in some very difficult environments. Susan, who I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, who'd received the death penalty at the age of 21, studied from death row in Uganda and completed her high school education. She established a choir for the women in her prison and wrote songs for them. We saw that music could bring hope in prison. In 2011, we got her admitted to the University of London to study for a degree in law by correspondence. Textbooks and lecture notes and case, case materials would be brought to her death row cell. She studied hard. Within a few months of uh, beginning her study, she'd gone to court and her death sentence had been overturned and she was given a period of years to serve instead. She performed highly in her University of London exams. She graduated this summer with a diploma in law. The most senior judge in Uganda came to her prison to give her the diploma. He said to her and to the other graduates, what you've done is remarkable. Not only have you gained this qualification, but you're already using your knowledge to write appeals for your peers, to coach them as to what happens when they go to court and how they can best advocate for themselves when they have no lawyer you have great potential to contribute to this society. And when you're out of prison, don't hesitate to think about applying to become a judge. To go from being on death row to having that invitation was, was something Susan and we couldn't have anticipated. We've seen that change comes when you establish medical facilities in prisons. In one, in Gulu, in northern Uganda, where women used to give birth on the floor of their cells. Those babies could die in the first days of their lives because they didn't have access to the most basic facilities. Establishing a clinic with a maternity unit has reduced the mortality rate there. It means that children who are born in prison have access to vaccinations at the beginning of their lives, which mean that they're less likely to succumb to disease during childhood. At that prison, we established a program 
where we train prisoners and prison staff to be adult literacy teachers, to teach fellow inmates how to read and write. We saw that women who had given up on the hope of having any education were leaving prison saying, now when I go back to my family, I can teach my children how to read and write. I have the knowledge to read what it says on a packet of seeds or fertilizer so I can begin doing small scale farming. We saw that these simple programs, identifying change makers in prisons and equipping them to serve their communities as legal educators, as literacy educators, and as health educators, gave people in prison a sense of purpose and the opportunity to contribute to their society whilst in prison and upon release. We saw that there were similar needs in prisons beyond Africa, that in the United Kingdom or the United States, overcrowding is an issue. The challenge of how to break the cycle of crime, how to stop prisons having revolving doors, is one that prison services globally struggled with. We believe that the way of breaking this cycle of crime is by giving people in prison education and the sense that they can contribute something to the lives of others. We're exploring the possibility of establishing a prison college to provide high quality tertiary level education to prisoners globally. We're inspired by the story of Mandela, who like our 30 students in Uganda and Kenya, studied law with the University of London by correspondence from prison in South Africa, and went on to lead his nation and to inspire millions around the world. This video clip shows you something of our education work in an environment that can otherwise be difficult to imagine. There are remarkable people in prison, people who have gifts and talents and skills which can transform their communities and their nations. These are disciplined, hard-working, determined people who've gone through the fire, who know what it means to be in conflict with the law, who know what it means not to have representation, and are determined to use their skills to serve others. And the best way that you can demonstrate that at this stage is by performing excellently in your exams. So we meet every morning from 8.30. We learn for two hours. We have a lecturer for each day. Common law, the criminal law. That's something you could be answering about negligence manslaughter instead of answering about constructive manslaughter. Just because you didn't identify the proper problem. As I, I visit prisons around Africa, I see that so many of the people who are there are there because they're poor. Kenya and in Uganda we have these guys who are studying for diplomas and degrees in law with one of the, the best universities in the world. What does this say about the, the power of hope and the power of transformation and the change that's possible in all of our lives? Last week we spoke about Susan Chigula in Uganda who got her death sentence overturned after, after starting studies with the University of London. The investment that you make in learning today can never be taken away from you. If, as a community, we can't find it in our hearts to forgive, how can we expect to receive forgiveness ourselves? Imagine if you were de defined by the thing that you were most ashamed of, whether that was cheating in exam, shoplifting when you were young, or having an affair. Just because someone has stolen, it doesn't mean that they'll always be a thief. And as a society, we lose out if we don't recognize that all of us have good and bad in us and the potential to do good and bad. Let us remind ourselves what Mandela said, that no one should judge a nation until they've spent time in its prisons. A nation shouldn't be judged by how it treats its highest, but how it treats its lowest. What then for us, as members of the global village, as people who see ourselves as free thinkers, how do we want to be judged? Thank you.